Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Christ is our firm foundation. And we're living in a society, and I, I thank God for the word he gave us today. We're living in a society of ever increasing wickedness that is constantly coming against the church and most of all against Jesus Christ. Mocking and scoffing at what Jesus said and who, he's, who he is and what he stands for. And because of that, if we follow Christ, it's going to happen to us as well. And in this context of Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus has been teaching the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples and anyone on the mountain listening to him. And he does talk about looking out for true disciples and how you would know who is a true disciple. You would know them by their fruit. And so he's concerned about people following the wrong people or listening to false teachers. And in Matthew 7, he reassures them that if they follow his way, they won't go the wrong way. And let's pick up in Matthew 7, 24, and, and I'll connect the dots here where I'm going today. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. We see here a parable, a parallel parable of two different types of people. The first one is the person who not only trusts in Jesus and hears what Jesus has to say, but obeys and follows what Jesus says. And we all know that adversity is going to come in this world. We're already under it and going through it, aren't we? Jesus promises us adversity. He promised that to the disciples. It's going to come to us as well. And we go through things, many different kinds of adversity. But the key is if we follow his word, we follow the Bible and Christ's teachings, we will still be standing in the midst of that adversity. The person who hears the words of Christ but does not obey them and live them out and follow its ways, well, when the adversity comes, it will cause their life to fall apart. Pastor Kuhn used to say, at least if you're on the bedrock or the rock of Christ, at least if things get hard and things start falling apart, at least you fall upon, upon God. Amen? And sometimes things do fall apart. But the cool thing is, is you can rebuild because you still have the foundation. Things can come tumbling down in your lives, even as a Christian, but because there's still a foundation, you can always rebuild. Praise the Lord for that. But those who would be foolish in building their lives in sand, have you ever built a sandcastle, by the way, near the, near the waves? It doesn't last long, does it? For some reason, we choose to build our lives in such a way that we don't have a sure foundation, and that would be to build our lives on our own philosophies and ideas rather than on Christ and what he says to do. And I think about the waves, and I want to focus on this adversity. Now, adversity can be many things. It could be uh, the temptation from the enemy. It can be temptation even from our own sinful desires. Uh, it could be the, the allure of the world and the deception in the world of, of following pleasure. If you remember the four soils, there were seeds planted in these different soils. And there was different things that cause people, it causes people to lose their faith and the seed doesn't grow. And so adversity, it could be also hard times in life, the discouraging things that happen. But I want to focus on the waves of new false teaching. So I think it, I found it very confirming what we heard from our brother today in the word. 
from the word that was delivered today because where I'm going is being careful in our world, there's deception going on in our nation. There's pure, uh, just, I want to say pure evil, but there's evil deception going on. It's just, it's there. It's so obvious, you know what I mean? It's so there. You could see it. And, and this is what Ephesians 4, 14 says. And the reason the church exists is to help people be grown up and mature so they can look out for this false teaching. And this is what Paul tells the church in Ephesians 4, 14. The reason why we grow and mature is then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Wow. The new teaching and ideologies in our country and around the world seek to undermine God's word and destroy our faith. According to our scripture, Jesus is trying to say he's a safe base, a sure foundation. Jesus is teaching us that his teachings are true. Jesus is teaching that following them will make us strong in the face of adversity and deceit. Now, that doesn't sound like oppression, does it? That sounds like love. But unfortunately, in our society today, we are told that Christian beliefs in historical, biblical, absolute truth is a form of oppression on people's lives. What I see is, is that God sees adversity coming, so he wants us to be built on his life so we can live free in the boundaries and the safety of his word. That's not oppression. That's to be thriving. Of course, people will use scripture and distort it and do mean and terrible things to people, and that is to be abhorred and rebuked, to not use the word in the true spirit of, of purity of the word and to use it in the right manner that God would have. But what Jesus says to do, what God's word says to do is never to oppress people, but to help people thrive, to help people survive, and to help people get to eternal life. Now, Jesus isn't the only one that says, make sure we build our lives in Christ. Paul goes and says this in Colossians 2, 6 through 8. I'm going to read it with you on the screen here. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, keep it up there for a moment. And now, let our, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. There's lordship there that we submit to what Jesus says because he knows what he's talking about. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. That's to obey God's word. If you want to grow deeper, if you want to be solid in the foundation, you can't just hear the word. You have to obey the word. And you'll find out it works. As I said last week, if you work the word, the word works. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth. You were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. That's why we praise God when we come to church. We're overflowing with thankfulness. The word of God is true. Next verse, though, Paul doesn't stop there. He says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. In other words, don't take your wisdom and knowledge from man. It's nonsense compared to the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I trust Jesus, trust me, over other things that people say. Now, Paul gets a little bit more explicit and... He talks about this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. Here's what that says, giving a warning to the pastor, Pastor Timothy. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith, they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Hmm. What's going on in our nation? What's going on in our world? Demons are teaching things and people are falling for it including people in the church. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. They don't feel a sting from their sin. They don't feel bad for what they're doing. They just want to teach these things. They've been deceived by demons and now they're teaching the same things. Let's go to the next uh, book, Second Peter. Peter talks about this as well quite a bit in the entire chapter of Second Peter 2. 
but I'm going to give you these few verses. But there were also false prophets in Israel. There was false prophets in the Old Testament that God dealt with, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them, meaning God, Jesus. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. So these are people who have left the way and they're now teaching heresies. And I want to clarify that you don't just have to be a teacher of a church, okay, or a pastor. Anyone who tries to teach the Bible, nowadays it's online everywhere. People who claim to know the Bible and then teach it and claim to be teachers. But now, even in the church, ordained ministers are teaching heresies. So just so you know, if you pick up the Bible and you learn things and you teach your kids something that's not true, you fit into this camp. Okay, so let me keep going. Uh, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. It's, it's always interesting, by the way, that, that false teaching always has immorality with it. Isn't that interesting? It's a distortion of God's word, and it's also a distortion of his ways of living. So you know them by their fruit. That's why Jesus mentioned that in, in Matthew 7 as well. And because of these teachers, tell me if this sounds familiar, the way of truth will be slandered. The way of the Christian faith, the historical biblical truth of Jesus Christ and the church that believes in, this, in the fo uh, solid foundation of Christ will be slandered. We will be hated. Well, that's happening, isn't it? And then Peter's talking about these false teachers who are out to make money. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. Hey, drop $100 in, I'll give you a prophecy. <laughs> drop $100 in and I'll heal you. Drop $100 in, I'll tell you about your future. That's not biblical. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. Oh, wow, okay, wow. So these are pretty obvious, right? So let me share with you what's going on in our world right now and what I see in Christianity. It's really concerning. And I'm going to focus on two waves of false teaching and, and, and there's two concerns that I have. And that is the progressive Christian movement and the deconstructing faith movement. The world has different views of the Bible. You know, there's those who go, well, I don't really even believe in God, so I'm not even really going to follow the Bible. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense. At least you're being consistent. Then there's those who know a little bit about the Bible and they've read it some, but they just decide not to seek to understand it and they're kind of done with it too. And then there's those who study the Bible or know even a little bit about it and they're skeptics of the Bible on purpose. They're critical. They want to dismantle the Bible as not infallible, as not true and not reliable. That's not necessarily the progressive Christian movement. This is the progressive Christian movement. They believe that some of the Bible is true, not all of it. They know that you can't really refute the Bible because it's irrefutable. Every time you do research on it, it's historically accurate. That's why I talked about the reliability of the Bible for three weeks. So you guys could also believe that it's true. The Bible is truth. It is historically true. Uh, verified. But what they do is they won't argue away completely the accuracy of the Bible because they know there's a lot of truth in it. What they do is they seek to misinterpret it and change what it means. Why? So they can live however they want. Talk certain things out of Scripture as antiquated, outdated, irrelevant for our times. Culture has changed, so the Bible should change. Well, obviously, I disagree with that. In fact, I find security and safety in something that doesn't keep changing. If you give it time, all the world's philosophies and heresies will change again. And they keep contradicting themselves. So what we used to have is really just two camps. The camp of the Christian church who believes in the word of God as the absolute truth and all the doctrines like Jesus is Lord and, 
and, and Jesus is the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit exists, heaven and hell exist, Jesus will come back and judge. There is sin. Okay, that's being talked out now. So that usually is the Christian church camp traditionally. And by the way, they'll use that word against us too. Well, that's just traditions. You've got to change with the times. And I mean this with all due respect, but I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, and I'm not trying to be mean to anyone in this area dealing with this or aware of this. I'm not trying to be mean. What I'm, who I'm talking to is the devil. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of him deceiving people. Okay? So I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty fired up right now because of that. Because we used to be then, on this side was the world, and they just, they believe in no God. Uh, they believe in, uh, you know, the Bible's not true. Okay, it's, it's written by man. They believe in postmodernism, relativism. Okay, whatever you want to be true is true, but it's not necessarily for me. All right, they believe in all that, agnosticism, atheism, and it was like, okay, we had our two, two worlds. The progressive movement, though, does this. Let's bring both together. Let's, let's go and let's say that, okay, Jesus is real and he really loves people, but he wouldn't love them enough to allow them to go to hell. That is a wave of teaching that's actually been around for longer than 10 years in America, and it's picking up again in our society. What I, I, I could go on and on and on about that, and I just want you to know, I don't bring up very heavy topics without the time to break it down in one service. Because I know full well that people can take a, a blip of my message and throw it online and distort because I didn't give a cohesive, comprehensive message with full context. We're heading that way in this series, just so you know. Right now, I just want you to be aware of what these movements are up to and what is going on behind in the spirit realm, in the spiritual world, okay? So what's been heavily influenced by, by that is the deconstructing faith movement. And what's concerning about this movement and both of them is they're causing deception in the church and many Christians are falling away and living in this gray area, this camp of trying to merge what God says and what we want to say together. What God desires and what we desire. That we can live this lifestyle and still be a Christian. Even live this lifestyle and be a priest. And I just want you to know that Calvary is making sure we understand the lines that have been drawn, the foundation that we're supposed to live on, because we love you. Amen. We love you. But even more so, we love God. And when we be faithful to God, and to be faithful to God is to be faithful to telling you the truth. I believe truth is love. Truth is love. And so we're redrawing the lines because I don't know if you recall ever making a, a sand castle in the sand, but those waves just kind of wear out that castle, doesn't it? And the thing is, is if you build on the rock, it won't wear it out. It's there. But sometimes it can, get, it can get covered up by all the sand and debris. So you got to kind of clean around it. We're, we're cleaning around it and making sure people understand there is a line drawn where we don't cross and we don't try to uh, marry the two worlds together. And you can look this up, but it's called syncretism, where you kind of pick and choose and cherry pick what beliefs you want to have and put it together. And therefore, you follow that belief. That's still man made. That's from the devil. Okay. So heavily influenced by progressive Christianity is the deconstructing faith movement. Let me share with you what Elisa Childress says about this. In the context of faith, she's an apologist for the Christian church. In the context of faith, deconstruction is the process of systematically dissecting and often rejecting the beliefs you grew up with. Sometimes the Christian will deconstruct all the way into atheism. Some remain there, but others experience a reconstruction. Praise God. But here's the problem. But the type of faith they end up embracing almost never resembles the Christianity they formerly knew. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad because they had bad example of Christianity. Now let's go a little bit more into it. Focus on the family, put this out. 
Despite formal definitions, there is considerable confusion and disagreement over what deconstruction looks like in practice, and the word means very different things to different people. So some people say it's not really a movement, it's more of an explosion, and it's everywhere. Like for different reasons, and you can't really put a finger on what it is. For some Christians, deconstruction is the process of disentangling from harmful and toxic cultural attitudes that have filtered into the church and embracing a pure biblical faith that better reflects the gospel of Jesus, which I am totally cool with. If we came from really bad teaching, we need to build our lives back on Christ. Okay, so let me give you an example. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit, manifesting even in church services through the body of Christ. We heard something like that today. Okay, we believe in God giving us, giving us gifts to heal, gift of faith, all these different things. We believe in that. Some churches don't. And so when they come here, sometimes we have to help them understand why we believe that. Okay? So that's refining faith. But I wouldn't necessarily mean, uh, say that's deconstructing completely. But my mom grew up in a legalistic church where everything you, you were only good if you did everything right, then you're good. That's works-based salvation. So she had to deconstruct that. But she wasn't using her own ideas to do that. She used the Bible. She used Jesus. So sometimes there can be a healthy process. This is what they go on to say. This is admirable, something all followers of Jesus should pursue to make sure we're on the gospel of Christ. But in other cases, deconstruction involves redefining or rejecting core doctrines of the Christian faith to bring it in line with current cultural values. That's where I have a problem with it. This is deadly to one's spiritual health and often leads to total abandonment of the faith. Would you agree with me on that? Do you agree that that's a concern? It's what I'm seeing. It's what I'm seeing with some of my college friends that studied to be a pastor. It's what I'm seeing with people in the church across America and the world is abandoning the faith in the process. What's fueling this deconstructing faith? Obviously, we know that progressive Christianity that seeks to, seeks to water down truth and water down the Bible is causing people to question their beliefs, core doctrines of their beliefs. So we know that's causing that. Skepticism from schools and universities. Your children, and uh, we have college age here right now, our universities are just completely bombarding our young adults and young generation to question everything. But here's the thing, there's no reconstruction using God or his word. Just so you know, the reason why is because the postmodern movement that has infiltrated our universities and schools wouldn't use the Bible to reconstruct anything because they don't believe it's true. How sneaky is the devil? Let's deny the reliability and validity of the Bible. That way, when they go to rebuild their life, they can't use it. They don't want to use it because they don't think it's true. So what do they do then? What do we do? Do we use the thoughts of man? That's what they're doing. Philosophy from man. Again, it, it, it just continues to contradict itself, though. So there's no safe base of what they're using to rebuild. How about some more reasons? How about moral and sinful decay in our world and in the church? Sinful compromise. What's happening in our world is Right is wrong, right? And wrong is right. Was that confusing? Because I said right? Right, right, it was confusing, right now. The world says that, that good is now evil, and evil is good. Well, you know why, right? Because we live in a moral relativistic world, relativistic world, where it's up to you what you believe is moral or not. So when the world is like that and the church starts to adopt that and bring it into the church, now we're having to go, well, wait a second, maybe this was wrong all, the, all along. Maybe I do need to change my view on this doctrine in the Bible. That's not true. Why? Because you want to live a certain way? 
It looks like it. What about this? Social pressure. Society is labeling Christians as hateful and oppressive, so Christians are disassociating with the faith. You are being slandered so much for believing in Jesus Christ and for believing in the word as truth that people are leaving in droves the Christian faith, the church, because the world is demonizing us as evil and oppressive. It's societal pressure. In other words, you don't want to look bad, so maybe you should like start questioning everything and maybe you shouldn't go to church anymore and associate with Christians. That's a scheme from the devil. Church hurt. This is real. People get hurt in churches through relationships and friendships in the church or leadership and toxic leadership, toxic churches. People are hurt by it and they kind of lose trust in the church. And I love helping people through that process because I always bring them back to the word that we trust Jesus first. That our faith is not determined by others, but it's determined on Christ, right? Like our faith is in Christ. But let me tell you, church, we got to love and, and be patient with one another and be humble and work together because it does turn people off. And by the way, just so you know, pastors are hurting too. Pastors go through church hurt too. We all do. You know why? Because we're human. What about this? So I'm, I'm talking about what fuels this movement of deconstructing faith. Let me remind you of that. How about this? Questioning God's existence and goodness because of death, right? Because of terrible things that happen to people, the evil in our world. So everyone will start questioning whether God is even real or good. If he is real, why isn't he stopping all this stuff from going on? That's a good question. And God warned us of all this stuff happening. And he promised us a new life with him and eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. There is an answer for that, but it won't always make you feel good. It doesn't necessarily take away the pain. And I'm giving you a quick answer, and I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> How about this? Another reason is the lack of biblical teaching, discipleship, and love altogether. Okay, when you are raised in a church that didn't give you a solid teaching of the word of God and didn't disciple you after you got saved and didn't love you in your, in your times of doubt and struggle, when you didn't go to a church like that, you didn't feel like you could go to anyone to get help. It wasn't there. And then when you needed help, it wasn't there. And church, we need to do a better job of that. We need to love people through those seasons of doubt and questioning and help them and be patient with them. And then I'll give you one more reason, and it's the obvious one. There is a spirit of deception in our world from the enemy. Simply getting people to completely try to live two lives, live the double standard and you can't do that. You can't live a double. You can't be two-faced. Either follow Jesus or you follow yourself. And the devil is trying to bring now, if he can't get you to deny uh, Jesus, what he'll do now is he'll get you to take part of Jesus and part of the world. That's the progressive Christian. Trying to have both worlds, the best of both worlds but Jesus calls to die to ourselves. Take up his cross and follow him. Let him rebuild your life. Let me go back to what I said earlier. I really felt like God was trying to speak to us. Ryan, I can't let go of that lifestyle. Maybe you were thinking that. Ryan, I can't change. There's no way. I don't even know what life would look like if I changed today. If I walked away from my life, I'm so entangled in it, I don't think I could ever live the life that Jesus asked me to live. I'm gonna tell you what we just sang today. He will never fail. He won't. He will help you rebuild your life on him rather than the sand of this world. He won't fail. He won't fail. 
He won't fail, church. He won't fail, my friend. He won't fail. Ryan, my desires are not of God's. I don't, I know it's wrong. I don't know what to do. I've had people in my office tell me, I know it's wrong, but I'm struggling to let go. I know it's unbiblical. I'm struggling to let go. That is the deception of the enemy that makes them think they can't change. Jesus changes anyone who would come to him and repent and believe him in his word. He will change anyone. <laughs> Amen. So what breaks my heart for people who are going through this, because I'm not putting up battle lines. Listen, as a Christian, you don't put up, you don't put up battle, like you don't put up just defenses that you can't walk through and go save people. We don't put up walls between us and the world and we don't go rescue people. That's not what I'm trying to say here. We don't draw lines and go, I'm never gonna cross that line even if my friend is lost in it. No, 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 no. We put on our armor and we go after those people because we love them. <laughs> what breaks my heart is when it's happening in the church, that's what's bothering me. And we have to be willing to be humble before the people that we're dealing with or struggling with or the people who are struggling with this. We have to be humble and we have to be submissive. And so do they. And we have to come under the word of God. And we have to agree to follow what the word says because it's better than what we both say on both sides of the table. And there must be humility within the church with each other. There must be an agreement that none of us know the right way, but this is the right way. This is why we're safe, because we have a sure base and foundation to check ourselves on. If the word says it, then that's what we need to go with. And I'm telling you, I feel for people going through these things. It breaks my heart because they won't submit to the word. Because of all the doubts and all the questioning and all the lies from the devil making us question the reliability and validity of Scripture. So let me give you, uh, I, I guess I've already given you a lot of red flags <laughs> about this, this movement, but I'll just say this. I think there's a healthy time to ask good questions and know what you believe and why you believe it. There is a healthy time for that. There really is. But in this movement, the majority of it is antagonistic against Christianity instead of fostering um, careful Christian thinkers, it's more just destroy Christianity. It's more demo. Let's just demolish it all. And then because the movement doesn't take the word of God as true, we arbitrarily pick what we want to build our lives on instead. We build with our own mortar and our own bricks that aren't going to last. And then my other concern with this movement is people are deconstructing what they haven't even fully constructed yet. <laughs> Think about that. Why are you deconstructing? You haven't even finished learning and growing yet. Keep going. Because, just because the world disagrees with us doesn't make the Bible wrong. You just got to keep digging and learning and understanding what God meant by it. How are you going to deconstruct something that's not even constructed yet? You haven't even finished the foundation yet. And you want to get rid of it? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm going to come back to that, okay? Because I have a remedy for us today. And lastly, again, what I'm really bothered by is the devil's behind the curtain taking advantage of vulnerable people. Oh, they were hurt. They were hurt. Oh, they lost a loved one. Oh, they haven't really been taught. <laughs> oh, they've been looking at different videos on YouTube, getting different views and beliefs. This is a perfect time to sneak in and deceive them. And this is happening in the church. Don't abandon Jesus. He won't abandon you. Don't abandon him. He's a firm foundation. He won't fail you, church. 
We're going to go through hard times. We're going to lose loved ones. There's, do you know why the Bible has tons of scripture about forgiving one another? Because we're going to go through painful relationships in the church. It prunes us. It grows us. It matures us. And if it's wrong, at least there's scripture to reconcile and to fix. The Bible is the, way, is the mortar that keeps everything together. And by the way, Jesus Christ says he holds all things together. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be adversity. Do not let those waves make you question everything. It just affirms, because he warned us of this. And you're standing in the right place on the word of God. You're standing in the firm foundation. So let me give you this. Uh, instead of getting caught in the current of the progressive Christian movement and the antagonistic side of deconstructing faith, let me, let me offer you what Christ was really trying to say and offer. Let me offer you what, what as a pastor who loves God, who loves you, who loves the word of God, the truth, let me offer you what I think we need to do. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll just generalize it with just this one statement, then I'll give you four things. Look to Christ. Look to Jesus. But I want to give you a heads up on something. Thank you, God, for reminding me. The progressive movement says, yeah, look to Jesus. And notice what he doesn't say. See, he didn't say that, so I get to do that. Oh, that's sneaky. Ooh, I'm here to expose that lie. God has reminded me to make sure I expose that lie. I taught last week that Jesus affirms scripture. He affirms God and his word as truth. So it's not just what Jesus says, it's also what the Bible says. The whole counsel of the Bible. Not just what Jesus says. And Jesus is God in the flesh, so it encompasses all of it. So hold on a second for those who are teaching you that. Well, Jesus didn't mention that. He kind of left that out. Does that mean I get to do whatever I want in that area? No. What does the rest of God, what does God say in the rest of the Bible? Okay, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page of that. So what do we do? Number one, biblical construction. Look, um, I mean this in love. Let's go to the Bible, not the internet. The Bible is the blueprint. Jesus is the blueprint for our lives. Let's go to the Bible, not the internet. And Pastor Kuhn used to say it all the time, check me out, make sure I'm right, make sure I'm preaching the word. Same thing with me. Yeah, my notes are online, so maybe you shouldn't read it right away, okay? Just joking. But it's on the internet, so yeah. <laughs> read the Bible. We're deconstructing before we haven't even read through the entire Bible yet. I'll be completely transparent with you. We've had pastors trying to be credentialed and ordained in the Assemblies of God who haven't read the Bible yet. You know what we told them in a meeting? Uh, sorry, we have to wait. You haven't even read the Bible yet. You haven't even read through the Bible yet and you want to be a pastor? And we said it in love. Don't get me wrong. Like, you're really solid in these areas, and you got these doctrines down, but have you read why those doctrines exist? Because that's in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you haven't read it all yet. And we're not going to throw you into the wolves like that, leading the church, or whatever job you're going to do. Read the Bible. Let the Bible construct your life, not the internet. Okay? It's the blueprint. Second of all, this is where things get a little tense. We need biblical correction. Just so you know, I would never build a house. It would fall apart. You know what I'm saying, right? I know people who can build much better than I can. Do you know what they use? They use rulers. They use measuring rods. You know what the Bible means? You know what the canon means for the scripture? What we have is the, is the entire scripture, a measuring rod. It's a standard. Okay? You need the master builder, Jesus Christ, to correct your life so you're built right. 
And so when you read the Bible, you have to be submitted to the great infinite wisdom of the omniscient God to correct some of your thinking and living. And it's painful, but the end result is a beautiful life. Biblical correction. Be honest with what you're learning and reading in the scriptures. If it's true, then admit it and apply it. Use the Bible to decipher and discern what is true. Hold on to what is true and let go of what is false because God won't fail you. Thirdly, we need biblical community. We need biblical community that believes in the infallible, inerrant word of God as true. I said the same thing there in the same line. It's true. You need friends that believe and are willing to never uh, sway from the truth of God's word. You need that kind of community in your life. You need biblical friends. You need biblical fellowship who is going to be honest with you and say, in love, hey, brother, sister, that's not exactly what the Bible means there. If you read these other three verses, this is what it's saying. If you read the context, it's saying this. And that's not exactly how you should live. Because they're your friends and they love you. And we need people that are going to be willing to stand. First of all, they need to be standing on the word of God as truth. And then they need to be willing to go, I love my brother or sister so much, I'm going to warn them that that's not right. Truth is love. And then lastly, and by the way, when you're getting with, with biblical community, um, you're going deeper in Christ together, and you're asking good questions, you're reading the right sources. Listen, when I, when I get stuff, I've made my mistake a few times in life, um, even as a pastor, while I've read a really good quote, and I'm like, oh, let me share that, that's really powerful. And then afterwards, I research the person, and they're completely a person you don't wanna share. So I deleted it, because you need to. Why? I don't want anyone to go read that person's book. Because the devil will use that. So ask good questions, study good sources, be careful of who you learn from. And lastly, all of this results in biblical conviction. You know what conviction is? Conviction is this is truth. This is the way, no matter what everyone else says. I think of the beams that hold up beach houses that dig into the ground into the bedrock, those beams are convictions, they're doctrines that would never be removed or moved by waves. They stay. They're rocks. I'm going to use rocks. You ever walked on those rocks that go out into the ocean? They're going to be there, and they're not going to move no matter how many waves of, of new teaching come. Your convictions stay. And let me tell you something. I don't care if there's 100 people who disagree with what I believe in the Word of God. If God says it, then God is right. God is right, right? If, if an entire nation disagrees with Judeo-Christian Judeo values and teaching, the nation is wrong. It's wrong. And it's lost its way. Pure and simple. Right? That's... What it mean, that's what it means to have biblical conviction. And, and the thing is, just, just real quick, um, when we sing Christ is our firm foundation, the reason why we won't fail isn't because of our works, it's because Christ doesn't fail. So make sure we sing that right. The reason why we're still standing in here today the reason why we still have faith and we still can be here and, and that God has blessed us and helped us and we're surviving, it's not because of you, my friend. It's not because of me. It's because of Christ. Because he is firm and he is constant and he is truth, that's why we're still here. That's why we're still standing. That's why we're still safe. Amen? Ooh, man, praise God. Let's stand together and pray. Hey, I came on heavy today because I love God. 
I love you. Bible says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. In that same context, it says the truth sets us free. If you're bound in some kind of sin or lifestyle, freedom is in faith in Christ. You can be set free from every lie and scheme of the devil, every stronghold from sin and the enemy. You can be set free right now in Jesus' name. And I, I would be, I'd be wrong to not take a moment to ask you to do that today. If you feel the Holy Spirit coming upon you to turn from your ways and build your life in Christ, do it today. I'm not going to go through some formula, prayer, or anything like that. Just start saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. Let's pray right now for those people who may be going through this. Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I know your word. I know who you are. And I have been allowing this world and the deceitful new ways of, of teaching and lies affect me. And God, I turn away from that. I repent and I turn to you. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. And I reconstruct, I build my life on you and your word. And Lord, for anyone in this room who has felt completely stuck in their sin and they can't be set free, I pray, God, that they will call upon your name today and be set free in Jesus' name. Set them free from the strongholds and the bondages from the evil one and our own sinful nature that we have allowed to control us. But you have come to set us free And we are free indeed when we're in you. Lord, I pray you would set them free from that bondage today. And Lord, renew their mind with the word of God, forsaking the patterns of this world, no longer conforming to the ways of this world, but being transformed by your word and your will for our lives. I thank you, God, for speaking to us as a church to remain strong and firm in your foundation. I thank you, God, that this this church cares about the truth. And because we care about the truth, we love people. And God, we will stand strong in your word and not let these waves of new teaching sway us or move us. We are convicted by your word and convinced in your word. We thank you, Lord. Save people because of your firm foundation. Use us. It's not us. It's you in us and through us, glorifying you. Use our lives to point people to the firm foundation, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us to live this out in this nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.